My name is Brittany Falls, and my son's name is Jake Falls. He was born on August 28, 2013, and he passed away on September 5, 2016. Jake was born with SN8A epilepsy. Although we did not know that, we did not receive that diagnosis until he was about 18 months old. Um, Jake developed um, EIEE, -E -E, early infantile epileptic encephalopathy, due to his uh, severe, uncontrollable tonic clonic seizures that he began to have at 10 weeks of age. We brought Jake home as a completely healthy, what we thought was completely normal baby. Um, birth was completely normal. Pregnancy was completely healthy. Everything went completely as planned until his first tonic clonic seizure at 10 weeks old. My husband and I are both medical professionals. And so when he had his first tonic clonic seizure, I immediately thought that it was a seizure. I called my husband into the room. It didn't last very long, I would say less than one minute, and then it was over. But most 10 week old babies, they generally sleep a lot. So when he immediately went from a tonic clonic seizure into a sleeping state, of course, we called the ambulance, we went to the hospital, and was diagnosed with Sandifer syndrome, reflux. Your child is completely fine. It was basically chalked off as we just made this up, which we knew we did not. Your child probably just refluxed. He probably um, just refluxed on his formula, his bottle. Uh, everything's going to be fine. But this continued to happen. And within a couple of months of these continuous tonic clonic seizures, my child continuing to not progress at all. By about uh, three and a half months of age, my child was not your typical three and a half month old. He couldn't hold his head up at all. Um, he couldn't look around like most children. Although he was very happy and he was very alert when the seizures weren't going on. And because of that, um, doctors didn't think that it must not be a genetic disorder. He had no facial abnormalities. Um, he, you know, there was no indication that it must be genetic. So when we went into the hospital, they did an EEG and confirmed that they did believe that it was indeed seizures. So we started your normal round of um, Capra and phenobarbital and um, sent off for the normal round of basic genetic testing, which of course came back normal. And they sent us home and said, oh, he'll probably just grow out of it. And although my husband and I were both medical professionals, we were also completely new to this world of a child with special needs and medical fragilities and medical complexities. And I believe that my son would grow out of it. And, um, he was very happy. He was very alert and oriented. Um, and although the medicines never worked, we continued to try new medicines over time. 
When the capra and the phenobarbital didn't work, we continued to try different medicines that still didn't work. Uh, his seizures would get worse. Um, they were always tonic clonic. They continued to get uh, uh, more severe in frequency, more severe um, in duration and time. But he was a very happy and very loving child. Um, but he didn't progress much physically. He was never able to sit up on his own. He couldn't hold his head up very well on his own. So I knew that there must be some sort of underlying diagnosis that we were missing. Um, that just seizures alone could not cause my child to be so far um, delayed physically. But even the neurologist, you know, she said, well, we, you know, we, the the genetic test is, it, you know, comes back as the, it's negative. Um, we don't know why he's so far delayed physically, but we've, we've got to believe that it's, it's just because his seizures are so severe. He was very, very hypotonic. He had no muscle tone at all, but um, she chalked it off to the fact that he, uh, was on so many seizure medicines and they caused, you know, the, the lots of side effects. And um, then if we continued with our therapies and if we could ever get the seizures under control, then he would uh, continue to progress as a normal child. But unfortunately for us, um, after Jake's first birthday, at 13 months of age, out of the blue, with no rhyme or reason, um, his seizures began to get out of control, uncontrollably. Um, he began to have severe tonic clonics, multiple a day, every day, without warning, with no stop. And no rescue man's at home, would make them stop. We had our diastat, we had our clonazepam, um, but nothing would stop at home. So we go into the hospital and we, we do all of our IV medications and nothing will make them stop. Just constant, uncontrollable seizing. And we knew them something is definitely wrong. There's got to be something definitely causing this. So at that point, they sent off for the rare genetic testing and they told us to prepare to lose Jake, that they don't know what's causing these uncontrollable seizures, but that there must be some underlying genetic disorder that he has that they must have missed and that we should prepare to lose him at this point. Basically to take him home and love him. And that's when we sent off for the rare epilepsy genetic panel. And we took Jake home as a completely lifeless, completely lethargic um, child that was 13 months of age that had lost all abilities. He had lost, due to the uncontrollable seizures, he had lost his ability to eat by mouth. Um, we had to put in a feeding tube. He lost his ability to swallow. He had to be suctioned at all times. Um, he lost his ability to control um, his body movements. He was a completely lifeless child. He couldn't move his extremities anymore. He couldn't turn his head from side to side. Uh, all I can describe it as is the seizures were killing his brain. We had uh, enough rescue meds 
and enough constant mess, seizure mess, to he would stop seizing for maybe a few hours at home, and then he would seize again. And we just brought him home and we loved him. We loved our child. We loved him fiercely. We loved him intently. That's what you do with your your child. You'll do anything to save your child. Um, about two to three months later, we get a phone call from our neurologist. And she said that she had never heard of SCN8A, but that's what Jake had. And she had done some research. And at the time, there were less than 100 cases. I want to say my Jake was this the 70 something case in the world. She said that it was a sodium channel um, gene and that we needed to try all the sodium channel blocker drugs and we would see if any of those worked. And so we did, we began to try all the sodium channel blocker drugs. And those did help. They helped more than the other drugs. They gave Jake some relief where we could go a day without a seizure. We might could go two days without a seizure. It gave him the ability to be a little more alert, a little more oriented. But that's not life. For children like my son, that have some of the most rare, some of the most severe epilepsies that that exist. That's not life. That's why these drugs need to be invented. That's why you need to do what you do for children like my son that have these disorders. Because one day without a seizure is not life. And watching your child suffer endlessly is not life. Basically, the, the endless drugs that I had to give him to make him stop seizing cause such detrimental side effects to his body that you you get to the point of what's worse, the side effects or the seizures. Because sometimes, sometimes with drugs, the side effects may even be worse than what you're taking the drug for. And some of the side effects were even worse. So as a mother, I was having to choose what, what is worse for my child? Um, in the end, my son suffered so much. In three years and eight days, he suffered so much. Um, he, he broke bones in the end. He had organ failure in the end. The, the side effects of, of severe epilepsies is so severe that I can't even describe it into words. The fact that I, as a mother, had to choose to let my son go because Choosing to let him go and not suffer in this life anymore was better for him than to continue allowing him to live and suffer in this life. No parent should ever have to choose that. But I was at a place that my son was suffering more every minute of his life. That 
that I had to let him go. And no parent should ever have to choose that. That is why medicines must be in place. The quality of life must be greater than the quantity of life. And I had to make a choice that when my son's quality of life was not greater than his quantity, then I would have to let him go. And he had no quality. There was no quality left. There was nothing but endless suffering from my angel, my precious, my most valuable prized possession in this life, three-year-old son. And so I had to choose to let him go. And if you're watching this and you have children, I want you to put yourself in my place and think how hard that was for me. To watch my child suffer so endlessly that I had to let him go because his suffering was so great from his severe and profound epilepsy that I didn't cause, that he was just born with. So I'm asking you to help us, to help children like my son, to help the future children. I never want another mother to live what I live. I never want another child to have to endure what my child has. I never want another mother to have to go through what I go through. But I will fight for the future children. I will fight for the future mothers because they must have a voice and they must be heard. Thank you.